So hello, I'm Caitlin Lowenth. I'm the Artistic Director of TheaterWorks, and I'm here today with UCCS student and actor, Ali Langley. Ali, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Olivia Langley. Um, I'm a UCCS VAPA student with a concentration in theater and dance, and I'm very excited to be here. I'm so excited that Ali was involved as an artist on House Arrest and that also we'll have a chance to talk today about ethics and leadership. So I'm going to start with the first question, which is how did the process of working on House Arrest shape how you now think about integrity and the American presidency? Well, I think I was already sort of in the midst of questioning. Um, integrity and and you know the presidency just because i've been able to vote now for two um presidential elections which two yes two of them which has been great and so you know when you have the right to vote and you're able to and you're of that age it really is um important to really research and dive into these people who have put themselves in a position to lead um, a nation essentially and to make choices that are going to affect your day to day. And so I think that the process with house arrest, um, especially the interviews that Anna DeVere Smith gathered and some of those archives that she pulled out from older, um, I guess, generations sort of fall in line with that same idea of the importance in a vote, the importance in being an advocate and being um, aware of what's going on politically. Um, as you see in a lot of the um, monologues, um, there are instances of questioning integrity, um, especially when it comes to the presidential monologues, as well as a lot of um, monologues from former slaves. Um, during those times. And so I think the process in that manner has really shown me um, that not just in my time, but it's been for a while now that there is really um, a focus on um, the importance of being active in politics. And you spoke, Olivia, to how the pieces that you worked on in particular sort of showed a journey across time. One mm -hmm. of the pieces being that of um, Elizabeth Keckley, the dressmaker mm -hmm. to Mary Todd Lincoln, and then one of the pieces being much more recent, um, someone who was active and thinking and working during the Clinton administration. So I'm interested in how, um, in how given that historical framework, how you thought, how you think about how transparency and the American presidency, the relationship between that has changed over time. Yes, well, um, with Elizabeth Keckley's um, piece, she was a former slave. She essentially had to buy her way um, out of slavery for the freedom of herself and son, um, which she did by taking out this loan that she paid back very quickly. Um, and she had the skill of dressmaking and tailoring. And eventually when she moved to Washington, she gained so much momentum that Mary Todd Lincoln caught wind of her and invited her to the White House to be her personal dressmaker. Um, and so I think that there's a really intense power in the idea that someone had to purchase their own freedom. Mm -hmm. And after that, through that dedication, um, eventually making their way to being recognized by two of the most powerful people in the nation at the mm -hmm. time. And then you look at the juxtaposition between that and Cheryl Mills's monologue, um, who served as um, a defendant, in a sense, for Bill Clinton mm -hmm. during his um, allegations of infidelity and things of that nature during his impeachment trial. And she's also an African American woman. Um, and so she, her monologue is about that idea of rightness and wrongness and how the law doesn't necessarily try to say, well, this is right, this is wrong, that's it. Um, the law tries to um, still get people to have those freedoms mm -hmm. while also maintaining that idea of things that are right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I think the transparency from, you know, Elizabeth Keckley's time of presidents um, 
before Lincoln even owning slaves mm. um, and that being a known and a cultural normativity um, versus something as simple, well, I shouldn't say simple because it was major, but something um, as sadly common as um, Bill Clinton being um, unfaithful to his wife and then having it, having less transparency in what was going on, which is why it turned into such a large thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think just that difference between um, presidencies and thinking, um, well, this is something that is a cultural normativity mm -hmm. and it's out there and there were slaves um, and presidents had these slaves versus trying to cover up um, infidelity mm -hmm. and having to have someone protect you in that right um, from possibly being ejected from being able to work as the figurehead of a nation. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that the public eye was very um, skewed at mm -hmm. some points as the presidency uh, began to develop through generations. Mm -hmm. And having that historical framework and now thinking as we move into the present times, how is the historical framework in your work on house arrest made you think about what um, presidents and elected officials and leaders in general can do to maintain the trust mm -hmm. that's so important to have with their, uh, the people whom they represent? Mm -hmm. Well, especially with um, Cheryl Mills's monologue, I felt that through her interview, she had to um, jump through a lot of hoops um, and dodge a lot of hard lines, not only as an African-American woman, you know, um, working as a public servant and everything that comes with that, um, as aforementioned slavery and how that was the place of African-Americans then and how it is now. So not only that, but um, having to sort of um, protect in a way um, that idea of integrity and trying to protect that public trust, um, I think is something that really is exhibited um, in house arrest. And I think that it's sort of shown me that full transparency mm -hmm. is how trust can be man maintained especially from our public officials who are supposed to be the ones serving us, um, as it's been stated. Um, and that idea of having to protect someone in court against um, um, an act of adultery or infidelity um, and having that be such a large blow mm. to public trust um, sort of shows just how um, necessary it is. Mm. And I think that house arrest in specific um, by giving us these little bits of pieces uh, or, or people's um, experiences and interviews um, really does showcase the difference between um, when there's no trust in what happens and the hoops that have to be jumped through mm -hmm. versus when there is public trust there and um, the real genuine um, connections that can be made between the people and their leaders. I really appreciate how you pulled integrity back into that question of trust. And so with those reflections in mind, um, how are you now thinking about how you are empowered to hold your public officials and your elected representatives and your president even accountable for their, for their actions and for representing you in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, um, I'm definitely going to continue to do research, especially a lot more research now um, than I have in the past because um, looking at these verbatim interviews, you see things that people have said. And sometimes um, the media doesn't completely announce that because they're worried about other things. So they can't get every little bit in there about what someone has said or done. And so when you dig deeper, you can see those those interviews or mm. those um, like publicly held, um, what are they, not conventions, but um, like panels or discussions mm -hmm. or things like that. 
um, and actually hearing what each person is saying and understanding, you know, um, what their subtext might be or um, what prior um, things they have voted for or against um, that you might not have thought about mm -hmm. before doing that deeper research. Um, so just reading those interviews and those pieces and watching everyone else perform um, those people, you start to realize that there are things that can be missed mm -hmm. if not um, fully dived into and completely understood. And so I think in the future that really does encourage me to take the extra step to find more information, more verbatim things that people have said um, and coming to my own conclusion in a way that I can figure out how to hold those public officials accountable. Mm -hmm. Same with um, going out to more, to more uh, rallies and things of that nature, um, hearing other people's opinions um, about certain issues when in those settings um, going to those public um, gatherings where state officials or city officials are there to talk about propositions mm -hmm. or certain um, things that they're looking at doing in the community, um, getting in touch with different news outlets, not only the large ones, but ones that um, operate, you know, um, on their own websites or through uh, even something like um, certain social media sites. Um, because it really is important to understand all of those perspectives and to um, find all of those instances of certain things people have or haven't said. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you don't grab the full picture, um, which I feel is something that Anna DeVere Smith does do in spite of taking all these pieces and adding them. Mm -hmm. And it really does create that full image for you, which I think is something I will take into my process of voting and, and electing people in the future. I love that. Thank you, Olivia, for taking the time to share your insights into the process and, and as these questions of ethics as they intersect with the work. I really appreciate it. Awesome, thank you so much for having me.